Linda Kramer has so graciously uh, agreed to provide uh, uh, this very uh, well, uh, much in demand uh, conversation, uh, especially since we're in the middle of climate week. Um, Professor Benedict Kramer is a member of uh, SJI social justice leadership team. I don't know, are any of you at all acquainted with SJI? Uh, those of you who are in the room, is this your first visit to our space? That look like y'all in prison. Um, we're normally like really excited and happy here, so you have to excuse my cheerfulness. Um, you're you're familiar with it? Um, I have a class here. Oh, good. I okay. take like the social justice conference. You do. Mm -hmm. Good. So we do have um, a social justice minor for those of you who might find yourselves interested in uh, a minor in this subject area. Um, your classmate and colleague could probably fill you in and all the processes and pieces in order to make that happen. But my co-director. Mark Chuck um, sort of heads up that will give you conver have conversations with you about uh, what sort of classes qualify for the minor, what other things you might want to be mindful of, and just give you some advising in that capacity. Um, for those of you who are on Zoom joining us, uh, welcome. Uh, we're grateful for the hybrid format. We can't see you, but we can see ourselves. Um, and um, we will proceed with ben, uh, Professor Benedict Kramer's lecture and then open the floor to questions whenever you're ready. Uh, okay, thank you so much. The floor in the show is yours from here. Oh, thank you. Nope. <laughs> it didn't work. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's okay. I don't think this worked when we had um, Dr. RT. As long as, it's as, good. as, it's long good. as it, no, it actually did. Remember, because I stopped it, but it's fine. It's fine. Okay. All right. Okay, well, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank yep. you. All right. Looks good if I take off my mask. All right, cool. I appreciate you doing that. It makes it easier for me to communicate, which makes it easier for us to have a conversation. Um, so um, my name is Jeremy. Um, students who feel uncomfortable calling me Jeremy can call me Dr. J, who is a very important basketball player in the 1970s. <laughs> if you don't know that, he's the first person to dunk from the top of the key. Um, so that's a very, uh, that's, that's the mnemonic. Um, I'd like to start by um, thanking uh, uh, the Social Justice Institute, Sam, in particular, for doing a lot of organization for this in the back of the room. Can we give it up for Sam? Aisha and Mark, um, who are uh, really strong leaders of the Institute. Um, Aisha also has done a lot for the Shaker Heights, where I'm from, and for the city of Cleveland. I, really, it's an honor to work with her. So. Um, it's nice to see you all. I know your teacher. We go way back, gosh, 12 years, um, and have talked about environmental issues a lot. Um, I don't really like lecturing, um, but I understand that given that you don't know me, I don't know you, it's not clear how much the topic of this course will, or of this, um, this talk will be of interest to you. You may feel like unclear if you have questions or inhibited, but you know, I'll just say this once, please feel free to raise your hand in the middle of this if you have a question that um, I don't know how things are working on zoom but if you uh, can send a question through or raise your hand uh, it's perfectly fine to interrupt me. Um, I'd like this to be like a more of a talk workshop. So as I understand it, the purpose. Um, oh, Okay, so that's that. Um, so the other thing I'd like to say is. Um, is. It's hard, it's hard to do this properly, but um, one, of the, one of the core things in this talk has to do with coming to terms with the history of colonialism. And one of, the, one of the things that's extremely important in this country where we live in, where country isn't the United States of America, it's, um, it's the land we live in that's been stewarded by indigenous peoples for thousands of years. Um, and a land that was um, sometimes traded out sometimes violently expropriated, um, and in many cases, in, in all cases so far, a land, hope this may change with the Biden administration, a land in which treaties with indigenous people have been systematically violated. Um, it's important to acknowledge the land we're on in terms of acknowledging that history of injustice and the um, intergenerational um, stewardship that indigenous peoples had for this land. Now, if, this, if, if Cleveland were an unceded tribal um, nation, we would acknowledge the actual nations that, um, that have a moral right to this land. But Cleveland um, was ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville, 
which was a military, which was the ended a military operation by the United States to gain land from a number of indigenous um, nations in this area. And so there is no actual tribe affiliated with Cleveland. So what I do when I acknowledge the land we're in is I just tell the history again. So it's the 1795 Treaty of Greenville made with a thousand chiefs and warriors from many different tribes. Um, and um, that treaty was subsequently violated by the United States. So insofar as we remember that the land we're on has been stewarded by um, what's called indigenous law, which is a form of, it's, it's different than our legal system. It's a form of morality that's based in customs, practices, roles, and responsibilities that is responsible for stewarding the land just as it's responsible for stewarding people. There's no distinction. People are of the land. And um, so insofar as we're grateful for the indigenous um, law and, and societies that have brought us here, I think the thing to say is um, to acknowledge that they did not industrially extract and degrade the land and they did not set the river on fire, which happened in Cleveland through the history of industrial uh, extraction. Um, and, um, and justice hasn't been served. Justice, we're not in the right moral relation with indigenous people in this country. And so for anybody who is a settler, or who is a diasporic settler, a person from another country who's taking part of the privileges of the settler country, um, it's important to remember that we have obligations that are grounded in justice to trying to figure out how we can sort out the complicated issues that um, surround indigenous sovereignty and jurisdiction in this country. So that's my land, what's called a land acknowledgement. And a land acknowledgement isn't just something you kind of put up at the bottom of an email, it's something that you live because the key to all of these things is that, is that you try to get right in your relationships with people. So um, that's, that's a long way of doing it. And I, I learned this from some indigenous teachers. You take your time, you do it right because it's about the relationships. So anyways, lastly, thank you for being here. Thanks folks, the, the folks who are on Zoom. Um, there are copies of this paper if anybody wants them um, and you're welcome to pick up a copy in the back. Would anybody like to, Anybody want to read along with the paper? Okay, so if you want it on the way out, you can do it. Otherwise, they can be for SGI. Folks who are on Zoom, if you want to copy of the paper, you can email me at my last name at CaseEDU, and I'll send you a copy of the paper. Um, Jeremy, I can just forward it to the now. Okay, that sounds great. And then also on the way out, if you're interested in a um, tote bag, uh, I used to have something called the Beamer Schneider Professorship on campus. I, served in that office. And when I left it to devote more time to my family, I made those tote bags. And there's still a bunch of them. They're gorgeous tote bags. They're these things. So feel free to take one, no strings attached. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're right by the door. Okay, so um, the, this is a talk on research I'm doing right now. So I'm, I'm starting to write a book called um, Inside Planetary Injustice. Um, and it's a book that's written from the perspective of living in a society that is involved in injustice and an injustice that is called planetary, okay? And um, the first thing to understand about this field is that the, it's a very strange term. I mean, it sounds like it should be like a, like a Star Trek episode, you know, planetary injustice, the Klingons versus the, you know, the Federation or something. And, um, but, it, but it's a term that's very precise right now. Um, and I'm good. part of my talk is going to be explaining what it means to talk about planetary injustice as opposed to global injustice or social injustice. Um, and the other part of my talk, which is the title of it, is that I started to take seriously, um, I started in this book that I published a couple years ago, um, I started to take seriously the claim that in order to understand say the climate crisis or the prevalence of plastics throughout the entire planet, the extent to which future geologists, if there are any, if we survive, would look back and realize that at a certain moment in time, plastics entered the geological record as a noticeable strata, which is crazy when you think about how much it takes to be a signal in geology. Um, or when you think about the prevalence of toxins throughout the entire biosphere, it is impossible for us to avoid 
multiple contact points with all kinds of toxins and endocrine disruptors and so on. And these are, you know, these are these are these are correlated and in some cases are shown to be causative of all sorts of ailments and they are contributing to species extinctions and so on. When you think about all those things, which make up what I'm going to tell you in a minute is the planetary, um, a number of people have started to point out that you really can't get a handle on them unless you deal with the history of colonialism. That actually the society that has brought us planetary scaled injustice, for example, climate injustice, is a society that was built off of colonial principles. And those principles are forms of relationship. They're built into the way that our institutions think of their relationship to each other, to us, and to the planet. And they're built in the way that we think of what it is to be an okay person. So that in order to actually come to terms with planetary injustice, we have to come to terms with the unjust relations that have been built into our society through the history of colonialism. So that's the, that's the claim that this talk is about. So you'll hear people say that the one that is most, um, I, I think most um, moving and powerful, you'll hear people say that um, 1492 is, the, is a beginning of planetary injustice, okay? And the person who made, makes this claim most strongly is a Martinique, French, Martinique and French scholar named Malcolm Ferdinand. And his, he just published this book. It just got translated with polity called The Decolonial Ecology, Thinking from the Caribbean World. And um, it's an amazing, amazing book. So someone like Ferdinand, and there, there's some other really important scholars, interestingly, Caribbean scholars, the great scholar Sylvia Winter, who's, gosh, probably in nearing 80. Um, she was also the person that Sir Ferdinand kind of works off of. But they, they started pointing out that these relationships that are driving ecological destruction and planetary injustice, they're actually relationships that were baked into colonialism. And as the colonial system settled into the world in ways I'll talk about in a minute and became part of the basic structure of the political economy of the world, and as it became part of people's sense of self, sense of society, sense of what is good and desirable and right, um, the colonial system started to reproduce itself like a juggernaut. And it's that system that is driving us into a extremely dangerous world with tons of um, injustice in it, ecological injustice. So that's the, that's the um, we'll see how far we get with that. Um, okay, so let me, let me just start because I'm, I'm gonna stop at 1230. I know that most of you folks are gonna leave. Um, if there are people who are still here who wanna stay or people on Zoom, then we can talk uh, in Q and A. So I'll just lay out a couple of things. This is like really basic stuff. Um, the talk goes into all sorts of details. Um, so the first, let's talk about the planetary. So a good person to start with, and you'll notice, by the way, that this work is very interdisciplinary. This person, Ferdinand, is a political scientist. Also, this is really cool. He's a civil engineer. He has a double degree. He got a civil engineer from the university, engineering degree from the University of London, and then realized that it wasn't working on the problems he was interested in, in urbanization. So he moved over into political science. And in this book, by the way, he does, there's all this um, discussion of paintings of, 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 of slave ships, actually. So he does art history in a really interesting way, too. It's, it's an amazing book. It's like a totally inspired book. The other person that I think is important for thinking about the planetary is this really the distinguished historian, Deepesh Chakrabarti, who teaches at the University of Chicago. And Good news for those of you who are around, he's gonna be speaking here next year, uh, spring 2023. I'm getting him here in a speaker series and I'm trying to get the Social Justice Institute to sign on to part of it. I think they will, which will be good. Um, but anyways, he just came out with this book. It's a landmark book. It's called The Climate of History in a Planetary Age. And Chakrabarty's thesis is very, very simple. His thesis is that let's say for the past 50-ish years, history has been told increasingly in terms of the global, in terms of world history. I mean, many people, many of you, I certainly myself, we, I grew up with history classes that were increasingly called global history, world history, world literature, global literature, global and cultural diversity, and so on like that. And um, 
Chakrabarty points out that probably starting with especially the 2007 report for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This was the report that really scared the crap out of everyone. Like it, it went beyond the scientists and it started to hit the public. It's the report that insofar as you grew up as students hearing about climate change, worrying about climate change, or as I like to say, global heating, as you grew up with that, it's, it's in large part because the 2007 report and what it was about sent shockwaves through the world beyond the scientific academy. So Chakrabarty says, starting around 2007, all of a sudden there's an attempt to start thinking about history that is no longer based in the globe or the world. It's not about human progress or modern, modernism or modernity. It's about planetary issues, the kinds of things you only know about if you study paleontology or geology or climate science or astrophysics or cosmology. It's like history that goes back to how this planet was formed, how it processes energy, how the history of life was formed, how life has, been, has emerged contingently, how life has dealt with mass extinction events, how it's responded, and these kinds of things. How the carbon cycle is of the, of the planet, how the nitrogen cycle is of the planet, all these kinds of things. And with Chakrabarty's point in this book is that, I mean, it's become ubiquitous now that even in popular culture now, we start to talk about who we are in our history with terms that come from planetary science. That's the key point. So that planetary and planetary injustice is referring very specifically to injustice that is drawing on planetary science to explain what's going on. Right, so take like, so if you're talking about climate injustice, somebody from a low lying um, island state is coming up to the United Nations and saying, we need help adapting to rising sea levels. We need technology transfer. You folks who have been benefiting for two, from almost 200 years of fossil fuels, you need to, you owe it to us to help us deal with the fact that your way of life has ended up, it's gonna end up pushing us off our island. So that kind of claim. Well, that kind of claim only makes sense because you can talk about the history of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, how it gets there, how long it stays there, what is likely to happen in the next hundred years in terms of sea level rise, and so on. And so, um, in other words, what starts to happen, in, especially in the last 15 years, in popular culture throughout a globalized world, is the planetary emerges from the globe. So think of it as like a new moon rising, right? Like here we are, we're in global history. We're trying to figure out what it's like to work together as a globe. We're thinking about issues of diversity, of modernization, of global inequality, where people are trying to live a better and better life. As Chakrabarty puts it, the people in India, in Calcutta in the summer want an air conditioner, right? That's the image. But all of a sudden you come to, you, it, this, this crashes into something that's rising against it. Oh, if everybody in the world has an air conditioner, the energy, just, just from that, the energy that's gonna be needed to power those air conditioners in the existing fossil fuel-based infrastructure is gonna push us over the parts per millions that'll get us toward four degrees of warming. We're at 1.3. Right now, all the hurricanes, all the sea level rise, all the desertification, the political struggles around Lake Chad, the stresses on Syrians that has also contributed to refugees, all of that is only 1.3. And we're scheduled for close to two. That means it's already in the atmosphere. It's just, it take, given planetary cycles, it's gonna take time for us, for the world to catch up. We're, we're, we're headed to two. But what would it be to head to four? Headed to four, some people say is, well, it's like getting near Venus or Mars territory, whole parts of the planet uninhabitable around the equator. Ice ages in Europe, just completely unthinkable, sci-fi stuff, the other sense of planetary. <laughs> so the point is, is that pl the planetary rises into the global and it, it contradicts with it. 
it jams into mod modernization and it forces people to think, how are we gonna think about right moral relationships, about justice when we are changing the geology of the planet? Okay, so that's the first, that's the first thing. Um, any questions on that or any thoughts on that? Good, clear? So when you talk about planetary injustice, that's what we're thinking about. Um, okay, so then the question is, let me just say, because I've got just 10 more minutes, is the, there's the bit about what's 1492 got to do with it. So I'm gonna have to be really um, like simple here, but the basic idea is that um, the system we're in, which is a, a for, for shorthand, I'm gonna call it a fossil, in, I'm going to call it fossil modernity or fossil fossil industrial modernity, because it's not just capitalist. It involves capitalism, but it also involves, for example, the Soviet Union or China, right? China now has a mixed economy, but it's not. It's a still a centrally planned economy to a large degree. The Soviet Union had a completely centralized economy. It also had the same issues with um, its relationship to the planet and its use of fossil fuels. So it's really it's really an industrial form. And those of you who are engineers, there's a really amazing work on the history of engineering about how the very definition of energy, the very definition of energy and its relationship to the laws of thermodynamics were actually bound up with um, a particular way of viewing the planet. I'll get to that in a minute. So it's, it's really something that's deep in modernity in the way we think about engineering the world and making our economies work based on it kind of industrial fossil fuel based energy. So um, anyways, the, the point is, is this, this um, energy, I'll call it an energy regime that we have. Um, it is, it, one of its roots, in, in some ways its first point Kind of the first place where you could see the planetary emerging actually occurs at the very beginning of colonialism in the age of exploration, what's called the age of exploration. So when Columbus was sent forward um, by Ferdinand and Isabella with a papal license to colonize the world and to find a passage to India, um, Columbus was sent forward with the goal of being part of an imperial project that will take the globe as a consolidated object and control it for the purposes of two things, plunder and empire. And maybe a subdivision of that is conversion, which is a, a complicated case, so religious conversion. But the, and when I say the globe, I mean the globe, right? So one of the images I have in this paper is of um, one of the earliest 1504 ostrich egg, egg globes. It's a globe made on an ostrich egg. You can find it on Wiki. It's about this big. And in the, in the age of exploration, the point was to colonize the globe, for empire to control the globe. And it's this first moment in, this is the, I would just argue, is one of the basic roots of, planet, of the planetary situation we're in. The idea that the globe itself is, and I'm gonna use some technical terms from philosophy, it's a practical object rather than our home, rather than something that for which we should have reverence, a moral relationship or something else like that. So, and so when you, so this idea that 1492 is a beginning of planetary injustice, or as they say, a root of planetary injustice, is, is that the motivation of the society that sent forth the explorers went with a mentality, um, uh, I would describe it as an immoral, wanton mentality, that everything outside of this imperial Europe was to be conquered or to be used. And it was racist. It was deliberately racist. That's what the Catholic Church helped provide. Everything that everyone that was non-European was not human. And so is subject to the same law of exploitation and extraction and use, hence the transatlantic crossing. Hence, as, as Ferdinand says, the world from the perspective of the hold of the slave ship. 
Okay. So all of this was set up there, a way of looking at the planet where the planet is to be controlled for empire and a way of looking at anybody who isn't frankly, a certain kind of white European male as potential fodder. And this also includes the working classes. Like my people, for instance, since I'm half Slovak, um, this isn't commonly talked about, but my family actually fled a different kind of slavery, military slavery, forced conscription, kind of thing that's happening now in with the Russian army. Um, and we were not considered fully white. We were Slovaks, dumb Slovaks, who worked in mines in Southern Ohio. So this logic was deeply divisive, hierarchical, and predicated off of the goal of extracting and controlling the planet and extracting wealth and maintaining empire. So that particular logic, I can't go through the ins and outs of it, but that particular logic became the basis for a number of things. Property in capitalism, where property is involves the right to exclude people from the land, rather than seeing the land as something that we have moral obligations to steward. It's not my property, I have an obligation to it. This became the basis of capital property. This became the basis of industrial extractivism. Oh, let's go mine and get as much as we can out of the land, but let's not think about the ecological relationships, including people who are displaced and hurt by that. It became um, also the basis for um, the international order. The international order through a long hit through the history of colonialism, a 500 year history that started to really settle around the middle to second half of the 20th century is an order built out of European empires. And when not a European empire, say if you're thinking of Japan or um, China, it's built off of the European generated idea of the nation state, where the nation state is, guess, get this, is a territory, which sounds like a land, based on the right to exclude, <laughs> based on the idea that you don't have obligations to the land, but that whichever nation state has sovereignty gets to do what it pretty much gets to do whatever it wants inside its borders. It, it's not about the land, it's not about the planet, it's about the power over things, dominion. So this entire system came out of the history of colonialism. So last thing I'll say, because I only got a couple of minutes, is that in this paper, I'm really interested in, I, I can't go into some of the debates I have with, um, so I'm, I'm part of an international organization called the Earth System Governance Project that's based in the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, and we work a lot with the United Nations. And there's a lot of like, high level policy people and all this kind of crap in it. And one of the things I do in this paper is I argue with them about some of their concepts. I feel that some of their concepts are not taking decolonial critiques seriously. So what does that mean? It means they're reproducing immoral relationships, but they think it's business as usual, okay? So one of the things, this will be the last thing I'll say today is I've been really interested in trying to talk about, so in this air system governance work, there's a lot of people who are like having an oh, an oh, pardon my French, like an oh shit moment, right? Like they're looking at planetary injustice emerging and they're trying to figure out, oh my gosh, we're in this juggernaut of global industrial modernism. Now it's primarily capitalist. Capitalism is completely short-term, property-based, completely generate selfishness, self-interest, competition, exploitation, not at all very conducive to thinking about ecological issues, very hard to make capitalism think about ecological issues. You can, but it's really hard. Um, they're having this moment, what do we do? And so they start talking about something they call um, ex novation. It's the opposite of innovation. So in innovation, you make a new thing to fix something. Ex novation, you tear something up. And one of the debates in this paper is that I think they're wrong to think this way, actually, because they're thinking in terms they're thinking in term they're they're thinking of the issue too practically and that the underlying problem is actually a, a set of immoral relationships that have been built into our society such as racism racism is a, our, the contemporary racism 2020 the summer of of fighting against racism is a legacy of black lives matter that is a fight against the colonial system of racism that that system was begun 
in the 15th century, right? So the, if immoral relations like that are at the center of dealing with injustice. And so one of the things, this is the last thing I'll say I've been working on is something, this is interesting, that comes from Germany when the Germans dealt with their Nazi past. We have one moment of it in this country. Right after the Civil War, we created the Freedmen's Bureau as a state apparatus to try to deal with the history of slavery. And the Freedmen's Bureau was very quickly undermined, co-opted, and, and shut down by Southerners who you know, could not, their white power could not deal with you know, coming to terms with the crimes of American slavery. Um, but, so we have a little bit of it, but in Germany, actually fairly successfully after the Second World War, Germany got together and create and did something called Vergangenheit Bewältigung, which means working through the past. And what I argue in my work is that in order to move toward planetary justice, from planetary justice, we actually need to, while we're thinking about all these things about climate adaptation, new energy regimes, um, you know, sustainable energy and so on, None of that's going to really work matter in the long run if we keep coming at the issue without having resolved our immoral history. If we don't get the relationships that are immoral inside our society and resolve them. And that's a process of working through the past. Another example is in South Africa, where this was done after apartheid. So the other part of this paper is take, saying we need seriously to think about the project, a state-based project not just some social civil society project of working through the history of colonialism with a specific attention to the way that this idea of the globe as an object of conquest has become part of our society. And so the last two things I'll say is like, so some of the implications of that is for example, we need to think about how we understand property. We need to think about how we understand sovereignty and jurisdiction when forms of property, sovereignty and jurisdiction involve an irresponsible, wanton relationship to the planet. And so I'm part of a kind of movement of people who wants to learn from indigenous law, but work within, um, actually work within Western law to start thinking about how to um, make it more deeply, um, uh, deeply ecological. But my gut is, is that this kind of thing won't actually change without constitutional change. And that's very far off. And, and even to get there, we need to work through the past. And I'll, the last thing I'll say is just think about what happened in 2020, right? Think about the insurrection. Like this is like a white power insurrection. And you can't, we can't even get our political system working because racism is that freaking violent in our society, right? So you, you, it's like the, the, what this whole work is. So if you want to, like, if you want to get to the point where you can think about constitutional reforms to try to create a sustainable society so future generations of Americans could live a, a relatively stable life, you have to deal with some of these other issues. It's all bound up. But weirdly, and this is why it's really worth you folks studying history, weirdly, it, it's, it's uncannily all bound up with the history of colonialism. And a simple way to point it is to point to what happened in 1492. Okay, so thanks for listening. So see you later. Anybody wants to stay? I'll we'll wait a couple of minutes, then we'll we'll talk. Meanwhile, anybody who is on the um, Zoom. If you have any um, questions or whatnot, please send them through. I'm sorry I can't see your faces and say hi in um, person. This was a, a Narcissus Sages class, which came up. Thank you for bringing folks. I hope it was a good use of your time. Yeah, thank you so much. It's actually that on Friday, you're going to be talking about planetary. Really? Oh, good. Yeah. Oh yeah, my gosh. So yeah. Yes, yes, it's a yeah, wonderful book. Yeah. yeah. And please take yeah. a copy of the paper with you yeah, because it talks about um, it talks about the book. Yeah. I really yeah. Oh, you're welcome. And take a take a book bag if you want it. They're cool. Yeah, I will. Okay, thank you. Did you get one? I left a bunch in Sage's office. Did you get a book bag? I don't know. Really? I left a bunch in the Sage's office. Please uh you, well, I don't know if they'll have one. I hope there is one. I'll, you know what? I'll I'll give you one, one second if you don't get it because I have some
Okay, what can you want to take a copy of the book? I was going to take a picture of it. Good. Yeah, I'm going to put a here on campus. Sorry, you guys can see Yeah, I know Jels. Yeah, I'm friends with Shannon. Oh, how do you guys like? Can you talk to the organization? Like, even in uh, ages ago. Oh, ages. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because like out of Brooklyn, all the stuff is. Hi, Brian. Um, what doesn't be so cool when they talk about? Oh, well, I'm happy to come sometime. I, I support you folks a lot. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try to contact you. Um, it's just my last name. At, at, my last name at Case. So at Case.edu. Yeah. So, um, um, fine. My last name is right here, yeah. Bendit Kimmer. Okay. And I'm in the philosophy department, so you can just find me in the philosophy department. What's your name again? Amanda. Okay, Amanda, I will remember you. Send me an email. Yeah, nice to meet you, Amanda. Take care. Yeah, you bet. Are we good? Uh, yeah, people are, the reason you can't see anybody is no one has their cameras on. Oh, no, it's no worries. People are, are starting off. There's a couple of people that are not sure. No, no, they don't censor any questions. That's okay. fine. Okay. Folks, thanks for being here. If you have a question, send it through. I'll answer it. Otherwise, uh, feel free to look me up and I'd be happy to talk with you. Th thanks for coming. Did I make a one question? That's some question. <laughs> what was the question? Um, is there yeah. this is a compelling topic? Is there a lecture? Which one are people? Yeah, and send her my send her my uh, email and info. Tell her to okay. tell her to um, email me, and I'll okay. give her stuff. There's going to be a um, series next year. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. Actually, um, we didn't get fair to uh, but. I might try to get him, but we've got Chakrabarty and a bunch of other really great people coming to talk. Oh, cool. That was like remarkably painless. Thank you. It was awesome and very enlightening. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't get over here sooner. Oh, no, it's always so good. I'm glad I thought I could help out. I'm really glad that you're passing. Yeah. This book is incredible. Yeah, that looks What is it? This book, this is the book I was talking about.